All right, guys, welcome tonight. We're going to talk uh, about soft tissue injuries. Kick this kicked off tonight. Um, so trauma applies the fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment and findings of acutely injured patients. Sounds like we've heard that at least one or two chapters before. So tonight we're going to go over wounds, burns. We'll talk about the electrical, chemical, and thermal, chemical and thermal burns and chemicals in the eyes and on the skin. We talk about pathophysiology assessment and management of the wounds, avulsions, bite wounds, lacerations, punctures, incisions. Oh, click. Um, so when we talk about burns, uh, we're gonna break those down. We need to understand the different types of burns. It's gonna be electrical, chemical, thermal, and radiation. And then we'll go into crust syndrome. So those are your four types of burns. Pretty sure you will see those in several other chapters. Um, uh, stand by one second. So we're gonna go over the crust syndrome. Uh, a little bit in detail about that. So, okay, so here's our introduction. So soft tissue injuries are common, which we know uh, we happen to see those at all the time. Um, they can be serious as a life-threatening or an internal injury. Um, do not become distracted by a dramatic open wound. This is not something that we just need to focus all of our attention on. Um, it, just because it's an open wound, it doesn't happen to fall into the uh, ABC category, we, we can deal with that on a, a secondary assessment. Um, soft tissues of the body can be injured through a variety of mechanisms. So we've talked about this before. We talk about blunt injuries. We know about the blunt and the penetrating. So then we have barrow trauma and burns. So those are your four, uh, some of your four of the mechanisms. Um, so here, all right. So soft tissue trauma is common form of injury. W wound care is one of the most frequently performed procedures in ED. Um, most of these injuries are require basic intervention. So just because they look super, super bad, um, it should not be. Uh, death is often related to hemorrhage or infection. Um, infection can be life or limb threatening. Uh, um, infections can be all right. So especially in children, older adults, and people with diabetes, other conditions that may compromise the immune system, infections are really bad for. Soft tissue injuries and their complications can often be prevented by using simple protective actions. Um, hang on one second. So the anatomy and physiology of the skin. So the skin is the first line of defense. That's exactly what we have that potentially is gonna protect us from everything else. It's gonna protect us from the external forces of the environment and possible infections. So is the so here, you need to know this. The skin is the largest organ in the body. It is relatively tough, but susceptible to injuries. Um, injuries may expose blood vessels, nerves, and bones. Uh, it can be a through and through, could be an amp amputation. Um, but most of the time we're gonna have ruptured blood vessels and that's where we're gonna have our bleeding from. Um, those, all that's gonna be made common just by a, uh, a skin injury. So, uh, and in all instances, the EMT must control bleeding, which we've talked about that before, prevent further contamination to decrease the risk of infection. If we have the ability to wash and like, not like soap and water, but you know, use sterile water and clean the wound out, we definitely want to do that. The cleaner the wound, uh, the better off it is for it to deal do away with um, infection. 
So apply dressing and bandages to various parts of the patient's body, depending upon how bad it is. That may be something that we initially address, or it could be a secondary finding and an assessment that we fix uh, as we move it around again. So skin varies in thickness depending on the person's age and the skin location. So skin is thinner in the very young and very old, which that's the reason why a lot of our geriatrics get skin tears. Um, a lot of our young, uh, when they slip, trip, and fall, they'll cut their cells pretty easy. Skin is thinner on the eyelids, lips, and ears than the scalp, back, and soles of the feet. So all of those are um, areas of where the skin is thinner. So knowing all that, we need to make sure that if we see those areas, we're probably going to have more um, bleeding in those areas. We're potentially going to have uh, it's going to look very, it's going to look a lot worse than what it really is just because uh, it's very uh, heinous. So knowing that you may have a lot of blood in those particular areas. Uh, anatomy. Okay, so let's break it down here. The skin has two principal layers. So you need to know the epidermis and dermis. So the epidermis is the tough external layer that forms a watertight covering for the body. The epidermis is compromised of several, sorry, composed of several layers. Um, the dermis is the inner layer of the skin, tint, tint, tint. It contains hair follicles, sweat glands, and uh, sebaceous glands. Uh, blood vessels in the dermis provide the skin with nutrients and oxygen. Here's pictures of the different layers. We can see how it's broken down to epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. You see the subcutaneous area is the yellow kind of uh, oval type places. That's just subcutaneous fat. Um, that's the fattiness that's in the skin. Um, we have your muscle, you have the fascia, which is the little white layer. Um, everybody has all these in their particular body. Um, you can see how the nerves are brought all, all the way up as it comes from the dermis to the epidermis. We have all these different areas. See where the sweat pore comes out right in here. So you have all these areas that this is, this is the breakdown of the skin from the epidermis to the dermis. I remember when I was taking A and P back in the day, we had to label all of this to make sure that we understood it and moved. Uh, we were able to keep going on. So skin covers all external surfaces of the body. The various opens of the body are lined with mucous membranes. So mucous membranes provide a protective barrier against bacterial invasion. So it's important that we have those mucous membranes. And majority of the time, we need to keep them moist, um, like the inside of our mouth, inside of our uh, <laughs> anatomy was rough. Ooh, ooh, I'm glad I had to take that again, which I should have already taken it and going to nursing school years ago, but it is what it is. Um, so mucous membranes are just as important as a protection layer as the skin is. So the physio uh, physiology, uh, skin serves many functions. Well, we know that. So we talk about, again, it's a barrier for infection. It is a sensory organ because we're able to touch, feel um, the hair on our arms. Uh, we're able to feel when stuff touches us through that way. Um, it assists with the regulation of body temperature. Um, if we're hot, we'll sweat. If we're cold, we shiver. Our skin kind of tenses up and closes the sweat glands when we get cold. And it just helps maintain fluid balance. We can sweat through this and get rid of fluid through the, uh, just our regular skin pores. So it has different functions to help our body regulate all types of things. Um, temperature is the biggest thing that it does help. Um, that we're able to uh, adapt to do just the skin on our arms and bodies and heads. Um, any break in the skin may allow some bacteria to enter and increase the possibility of infection, some fluid loss, and loss of temperature control. That's the reason why we have any type of trauma patient. We always want to keep the trauma patient warm and dry. The best thing that we can do is cover them um, if for some odd reason we do the strip and flip, we remove their clothes so we can see everything we do, we need to make sure to cover them. Um, they're going to lose uh, temperature pretty fast. So the warmer that we can keep them, the better off that we are. And saying that, 
anytime that you have a traumatic event, you probably want to turn the heat on in the vehicle uh, to make sure that it is warm in the backside of the ambulance. Uh, yes, we know if the warmer they are, they're probably going to bleed out. Well, they shiver fast too, because that's their body starting into shock. So if we can keep them from going into shock, the better off that we are. Three types of soft tissue injuries. So we're going to talk about closed injuries, open injuries, and burns. The pathophysiology of closed and open injuries. So healing of wounds is a natural process that involves overlapping stages. So all this is directed towards a large goal of maintaining hemostasis in the body. Uh, Ciation of bleeding is the primary concern. The next wound healing stage is inflammation. Adding cells, added additional cells move to, into the damaged area to begin repair. White blood cells migrate to the area that is combat pathogens that have invaded the exposed tissue. So lymphocytes destroy bacteria and other pathogens. Uh, mass cells release, hist release histamine. And then we talk about inflammation ultimately leads towards the removal of the foreign body material, damaged cellular part, invading microorganisms. So think about this. If you get a splinter in your finger, you're going to get the inflammation, the pain, the redness, uh, all that happening there because your body's reacting to an invasion of a foreign body. So you're going to start swelling. Then you'll notice the pus. Well, the pus is the infection. So what the body's trying to do, let's say, okay, you find it, you remove the splinter, get a little bit of pus out, it's over with. The body goes back to its normal hemostasis to where it's comfortable, and it's like, ah, okay, I'm back home, everything's good. To replace the area of damaged in a soft tissue injury, a new layer of cells must be moved into the region. New blood vessels form as the body attempts to bring oxygen and nutrients uh, into uh, to the injured tissues. In the last stage of the wound healing, co uh, collagen provides stability to the damaged tissue and joins wound borders, uh, thereby closing the open tissue. So our body's automatically realizing, okay, got a foreign body, need to get out of there, let's get it out of there. You get it out. Now the body starts the healing process. We gotta bring new cells into the area. We gotta work on the clotting factor. We need to create um, all sorts of things. They got to have the body just right before we can start healing that particular area of the body. So on closed injuries. So we know a contusion is the result from a blunt force strike in the body. So we should know that from the class, past couple of trauma classes that we should know that that's the biggest part. So the epidermis remains intact, but cells within the dermis are damaged and the small blood vessels are usually torn. The buildup of blood produces a characteristic blue or black discoloration called ecchymosis. So when we get bruises, that is ecchymosis. We know that we're ble having uh, free bleeding. They had free bleeding on the inside of the body for a while. So ecchymosis was formed. All right, so a hematoma is the collection of blood within a damaged tissue or body cavity. This occurs when a large blood vessel is damaged and bleeds rapidly, usually associated with extensive tissue dam damage. Ooh, man, I'm having trouble with these little words tonight. Crushing injuries. So the extent of the damage depends on how much force is applied, how, much, uh, how long the force is applied for, and continued compression of the soft tissues will cut off of circulation, production, or further tissue dest destruction. So we, on the crushing part, even though let's say I'm at a loading dock and the truck backs into me and they realize it so fast and they're like, oh, boom, boom, and they're off of you. So you will have crushing syndrome, but at the same time as you may not have it as, as severe as somebody that was pinned for a couple of minutes. Now, the only thing you have to be careful of is when you arrive there at VMS, if the patient is still pinned because they were scared to remove the vehicle or our object, is that once the body has a release of all that blood, you have to remember now this blood is contaminated. Some of the things that you're gonna deal with is potential cardiac arrest because the body's now in shock. 
Now it has to pump blood to the rest of the part of the body that, that was crushed or benched. So you're going to have, uh, you need to make sure you do have ALS right there ready to go. You have IV lines started, potentially having to get, um, you know, airman route. I've, I've had two crushing injuries in my entire career and both of them have passed away. So dealing with somebody that has had crushing injuries and uh, the ability to take care of them, it, it it's, I can't tell you a whole lot. I've dealt with them prior to removing of the object that was crushing them. But they they go rapidly. They they it's a pretty serious condition. Uh, when the area of the body is trapped for longer than four hours, their arterial blood flow is compromised. All right, there you go. We talked about it. So crushing syndrome can develop. When a patient's tissues are crushed beyond repair, muscle cells die and release harmful substances into the body surrounding the tissues. So some harmful substances are released into the body's circulation after the limb is freed and the blood is returned. So now we know it's toxic. So you can have ALS providers should administer IV fluids before the crushing object is lifted off the body. Hint, 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 since I just told you that. Freeing the body part from entrapment also creates the potential for cardiac arrest or renal failure. Told you again. Considered requesting ALS assistance for situations for prolonged entrapment prior to execution. If you realize that you're going to be on a car wreck for an extended period of time, just due to um, freeing the patient, ALS needs to be on scene or, or very close in route. The reason why is there's a lot more things that the medic can provide than we can as basics. So having them there, having that uh, IV established, particularly getting ready to intubate this patient for a rapid transport. Um, all those things are there and we can provide some medications. We'll call them comfort medications because there's not a lot of medications that's ultimately gonna save this, this particular person, but we can have everything ready from our medic and not even having to wait on them as much. Um, compartment syndrome develops when the edema and swelling results in uh, increased pressure within a closed soft tissue compartment. Uh, pressure increases with the compartment of uh, which interferes with circulation. Delivery of nutrients and oxygen is impaired and byproducts of normal metabolisms accumulate. There is pain, especially uh, on passive movement. Yep, I would bet so. The longer the situation persists, the greater the chance for tissue death. Continuously release skin color, temperature, can, sorry, continue to reassess skin color, temperature, and pulse distal to the injury site if the crushing injury is suspected. Because at some point, we're going to lose a pulse to that particular area, and the body is not going to be pumping blood back and forth down there. As long as you have a pulse, you know there is blood flowing to that area. And severe closed injuries can damage internal organs. Somebody tell me why that is. Why is it gonna have um, damage to the internal organs? For that. So since there's going to have damage to the internal organs, it's because the blood's going to be compromised. Um, you're going to start to have dirty blood releasing into the body, uh, potentially you have clots forming through. Um, and then the internal organs are just, they have, they operate on a very good normal hemostasis. You start messing that up, they start to have issues, and the organs just do not like to function well. All right, on an open injury, there are four types of open soft tissue wounds. We can have an abrasion, a laceration, avulsions, or penetrating injuries. All right, here is an abrasion. An abrasion is the wound of the superficial layer of the skin caused by friction when the body part rubs or scrapes across a rough or hard surface. So here, 
This can be from a little bike wreck. I refer to their abrasions as like carpet burn. Uh, everybody's at least had a carpet burn once in your life. So you know how those feel. It's just removal of the top layer of skin. Laceration is a jagged cut caused by a sharp, sharp object or a blunt force that tears the tissue. So you can see here how this is jagged. It's not gonna match up pretty well. They will be able to sew it pretty decent on the knee. But in this picture, that's pretty much a pretty good cut. Just a straight, solid, smooth cut. These are not. Talk about an avulsion. An avulsion is separates various layers of soft tissues so that they become in uh, either completely detached or hanging as a flap. Uh, often there is significant bleeding through here. Uh, the possible replace uh, the flat avuls flap in its original. They will try to replace that if they're able to, if. Never remove an avulsion skin flap regardless of its size. I don't know where the flap is on this picture, but you can see in this, uh, the figure B, that flap is obvious there. You, they want to try to remove that and let everything heal again on its own. Uh, I don't really see the flap in this picture. That looks like it was just completely torn off, my opinion. An amputation, obviously is an injury in which the body part is completely severed. Penetrating wounds usually leaves a relatively small entrance and produces a little external bleeding. Um, usually leave a uh, impaled object may damage to the structures deep inside the body. Presence of foreign materials inside the tissue can lead to infection. Even with a through and through uh, uh, pistol wound, or a rifle wound, that's still a dirty area. We need to make sure that wound is cleaned very well. We need to make sure that it is um, at least cleaned and covered as while we're with them. Now, granted, when they get to the hospital, uh, they're gonna take them to surgery and clean all that and make sure that there is no um, other, other injuries on the inside. And, you know, Penetrating wounds are kind of some of the easiest to deal with. Even though you can't see them, um, you can only see uh, backside stages of it. So if they have so much internal bleeding that you notice that their blood pressures are dropping, there's only so much that we can do to take care of them. That, I, that's just my opinion. They're easier to deal with because at that point, you, you can't see it to react initially. You, you, you have to be reactive to fix that which keeps you on your toes by watching the blood pressure, watching how this works, watching you know, all these different things as you're continuing to work on this patient. So it makes you keep your, uh, your attentive to this patient. Stabbings and shootings often result in multiple penetrating injuries. I'm um, assess the patient carefully to identify all wounds, count the number of penetrating injuries, especially with gunshots, that is very important. Um, for the police that arrive and also to the ED and to the surgeons. And in a shooting, determine the type of gun when possible, but do not let this delay the patient transport. If you happen to see a casing on the ground, you know that it was a automatic weapon. If you don't see a casing on the ground, that's either going to tell you that it is a revolver or a rifle come from a distance because every other one produces a shell um, unless that they have like this net or they were there to be able to pick them all up. So there's majority of the time your automatic weapons and I mean your semi-auto weapons as in pull the trigger multiple times and it fires, fits out casings. Revolvers and rifles don't do that. Last injuries often result in multiple penetrating injuries. The mechanism of injury from a blast injury is generally due to these three factors. Factors. Ooh. Primary blast injury is damage is caused by the blast wave itself and the sudden pressure change of the explosion. 
Secondary blast injury is damage from uh, results from flying debris that causes multiple penetrating wounds. Tertiary blast uh, as the victim is thrown by the explosion, perhaps uh, and into a object. Before you begin uh, your patient care with an open wound, follow your standard precautions. <clears throat> Gloves, mask, gown, eye protection, all those need to be remembered. If it is life-threatening bleeding is observed, assign a team member to apply direct pressure over the wound to control the bleeding. If you have to apply a tourniquet, this is the time that you need to do that. Uh, you need to recognize that and apply that rapidly. If the wound is in the chest, upper abdomen or lower back, cover it with an occlusive dressing. Uh, you guys should have covered that. If not, you will be covering that in one of your upcoming uh, boot camps. Control bleeding using direct pressure um, and even out elevation, direct pressures and or splints. And the last resort is going to be a tourniquet. So if I'm applying a dressing to your arm, and it bleeds through, I apply more bandages and I elevate your arm. If for some odd reason the elevation still does not occur, I can find pressure points. And what I'm trying to say is pressure points are where the, the uh, blood vessels come through and I'm able to apply pressure in that area and it slows it down from bleeding. Tourniquets, we know they're always really good. Uh, I'm not saying that they're the last resort, but sometimes if you see that arterial blood and it's just flowing, 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 initially it's going to scare you guys. Everybody's going to be like, oh my God, uh, tourniquet. True. You're not going to be wrong, but a simple dressing could have also done that with elevation and pressure point. All open wounds are assumed to be contaminated and present a risk of infection because no matter what, what's supposed to be in your body is now outside and it's probably contaminated with just with the outside air. Apply a sterile dressing, uh, reduces the risk of further contamination. Do not remove material from an open wound, no matter how dirty they, the wound is. Small wound surfaces without uh, significant bleeding can be flushed with a sterile saline prior to applying dressing. Chemical burns and contamination should be flushed to remove remaining chemicals. In most circumstances, hospital personnel, rather the EMT, uh, in most personnel, rather than EMTs, they okay, rather than the EMT cleaning the wound, they want to be able to do it themselves. So it's not a necessary thing to get done. But if you can clean it off, that's fine. In some cases, you can better control bleeding from open soft tissue wounds by splinting the extremity, even if there is no further action. Sometimes it's easier just sticking their arm in a padded, padded uh, cardboard slint and just instead of just letting them hang it around and you know, you're trying to bandage it and wrap it up and all that. Just put it in a splint once you bandage it and leave it like it is. All right. So an abdominal wound. So an open wound is an abdominal cavity is may expose their internal organs. So this is an evisceration. And this is has the organs protrude the, the wound. I've dealt with the same thing, except the lady that I had had a C-section. And her she sneezed after leaving the hospital from having her baby and her insides popped out. Majority of the time, you can see the bandages on this young, this young child or person's stomach that shows that there was a weakened area there. So you can see they probably had a, uh, an occlusive dressing here already for another wound. And this looks like potentially hernia surgery. Um, gallbladder surgery would be more straight across here and down, but it's, where an where a wound or, or thin layer already exists. It's not just going to naturally pop out like that on a normal healthy person. There's got to be an area of concern for this to happen at. 
Cover the wound with the sterile gauze, moistened with sterile solution. Secure the gauze with an occlusive dressing. Keep the organs moist and warm, and most patients with abdominal wounds require immediate transport to the trauma center. Now, granted, so you see what they're doing in figure A and B. They're covering it, and then they're applying tape on all four sides. We need to make sure that it is wet. Um, what I like to do is I'll lightly wet the bottom side, and then I will put it on the patient and wet it once it's on the patient. So what that is, is it allows me to wet the underside to where it's not going to stick to the organs and then I can tape it down. But if I wet it first and then try to tape it to the patient, it's just not gonna work because there's no areas on there that I can keep dry and that the paint, the, the tape will stick. Held objects, uh, there's a skill drill on chapter 27-1 of your books. Remove, so the only reason why we ever, ever, ever remove an object is if it interferes, uh, if it's in the cheek or mouth and obstructions uh, in the airway, and this is, the, it interferes with the CPR, period. If it's impelled in their cheek and they're unresponsive, we can remove it and then we can start doing CPR. Um, stand by one second. Now, let's see here. All right, so neck injuries. All right, so this is where we have to start being more cautious. We need to be more careful when we start um, providing uh, like C collars and injuries because now they're getting more and more to messing with the, um, the spinal cord. So open neck injuries can be life-threatening. So remember that. If the veins of the neck are open to the environment, they may uh, suck in air. So not saying that's a sucking chest wound, but now if we suck the air into the blood vessels, it can block the flow of long, uh, blood flow to the lungs and to the cardiac and they can cause cardiac arrest. This will create a air embolism. So cover the wound with an occlusive dressing, apply manual pressure, but do not compress both cricoid uh, arteries at the same time. I've had to do this in the past when I was in the Middle East. I am not able to cover the wound initially, so I stick my gloved hand over the sucking chest wound to keep it from sucking up more. So you can do that initially until you get a medical, um, you can get a, uh, like a, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, like a sandwich bag, you want something plastic. You don't want something like uh, a cotton dressing because you can turn around and have, uh, they can still pull the air through there. Um, this could, uh, so, if it is a neck injury like this, this can impair circulation to the brain and cause a stroke. Be cautious of that also. Use caution with patients suffering from a neck injury depending on the mechanism of injury. Immobilizing the cervical spine if indicated, including placing in a cervical collar. I highly, highly, highly suggest anytime that you start to suggest to think that there is a um, Neck injury or by looking at the MOI, go ahead and put them in a C collar. That's okay. We can always let the hospital that we take them to and the medical director remove that collar. Safer than sorry. And I know they're uncomfortable, but I would rather have you complaining and fussing and the whole time versus um, being paralyzed. So we have small animal bites. So consider the scene and crew safety prior to entering the environment. Um, you need to make sure if you're going to a dog bite, you know, have your control, your dispatch, your whatever you want to call them. Make sure whatever animal has been secured is police en route. We want to make sure that that is a big thing. A uh, small animal's mouth is heavily contained with brick. 
virulent bacteria. Consider the small animal bites to be contaminated and potentially infected wounds. A small animal bite should be evaluated by a physician. Now, when they're talking about small animal, we're talking about like a rodent, cats. Uh, this falls into dog bites. Um, those are our categories that we're looking about following when we talk about small animal. Um, you are gonna potentially have to have a debridement. Uh, you will, will need antibiotics, uh, tetanus pro, uh, a tetanus shot, and depending upon, you may have to have a surgical team come in and do a plastic surgery to you. Um, no matter what, they need to be taken to the ED um, and have that evaluated by a physician. Major concern in the spread of rabies, an acute potentially fatal viral infection of the central nervous system that can affect all warm-blooded animals. The only way to tell if an animal has rabies is they have to kill the animal and check the brain for infection. So they can't just draw blood. So if it is an animal bite and somebody says they suspect to have rabies, they're going to kill that animal and they'll do a, I forgot what it's called when they check the brain, but there's a certain, you crack it open and you look for the skull for any type of infections. Do not enter the scene until the animal has been secured by police or an animal control because the animal may return and attack you as well. You may this be this awesome animal whisper, but it's just not, it's just not happening. Don't go into that scene. Human bites are just as nasty. People are gross too. So don't think just because they're human, it's, it's going to be better. The human mouths are more, uh, more so than even small animal bites contain an exceptional wide range of bacteria and, and viruses. Consider any human bite <clears throat> that has penetrated the skin to be a very serious injury. Any laceration caused by a human tooth can result in a serious spread of infection. All right, this cute little hand here has obviously been uh, bitten. I'm not sure if it's penetrated, but we do need to apply a sterile dressing. Uh, promptly immobilize the area with a splint or bandage if needed. Uh, we can use a sling and swath. Uh, provide transport to the ED for surgical cleansing of the wound and antibiotic therapy. They may turn around and uh, flush it real well with you know, sterile water. They're going to try to see if it did penetrate the, the skin. And no matter what, 99% of the time, they're going to be on antibiotics for a hot minute anyway, just to double check everything. Burns. All right here. So dive off into burns. Burns suck. I've been burned twice. Skin grafts and all that, they are horrible. It's another reason why I kind of keep my beard. Um, burns are among the most serious and painful of all injuries. A burn occurs when the body or body part receives uh, more radiant energy than it can absorb, resulting in this type of injury. Potential sources of energy are heat, toxic chemicals, and electricity. Although a burn may be the patient's most obvious injury, you should always perform a complete assessment to determine whether or not that's the serious injury or they, are, uh, they have, uh, do have other serious injuries. Children and older patients and patients with chronic illness are more likely to experience shock from burn injuries. Um, so phys pathophysiology of burns. So the burns are soft tissue injuries, obviously. Uh, burns are soft tissue injuries that spread out over a large area and are created by the transfer of radiation, thermal, or electrical energy. Thermal burns occurs when the skin is exposed to temperatures higher than 111 degrees Fahrenheit or 44 degrees Celsius. So again, that's, that's pretty hot. So 
let's say thermal burn. Now, granted, the thermal can create other types of injuries, but the thermal burn is anything higher than um, 111 degrees. The severity of the thermal injury co correlates directly with, bing, ding, ding, temperature, concentration, amount of heat energy possessed by the object or substance, and the duration of the exposure. The pathophysiology of burns include uh, injuries are very progressive. The greater the heat injury, the deeper the wound it is. Thermal injuries can occur to patients who are unresponsive, paralyzed from heat sources such as a heating pads or a heat lamp. I remember when my back injury happened pretty bad, I was on a heating pad all the time. Normally, 99% of the time, I always had a layer between me and the pad. One night I did not had a uh, had it on high. Man, that sun gun wore me out. It burnt. Uh, it didn't do it again, but uh, that was a that was a hard lesson to learn. So those can happen. You can also get them from um, like I call them the rice bags. Like if you have you heat them up and then you lay them on a sore uh, sore vessel or a sore muscle of your body, you can have the same thing. Those they can have a thermal burn from there. Um, heating lamps, you can obviously get those also from tanning beds. That is considered a thermal burn also. Uh, suntan, uh, anytime if you're out there and you get that bad suntan on you, that's also a thermal burn itself. Complications of burns is the skin, oh, wait a minute. The skin serves as a barrier between the environment and the body. When a person is burned, the barrier is destroyed. Burns create a higher risk for infection, hypothermia, hypovolemia, and shock. Burns to the airway are very, very, very significant um, because the loose mucus in the uh, hypopharynx can swell and lead to a complete airway obstruction. If you get somebody that has been burned to the face, to the airway, autumn, if they've been burned to the face or they have soot around their nose, always, always assume that they have airway burns. And if you ever have to have somebody to intubate this patient, they probably only gonna get one, maybe two turns and then the, the, the the mucus in the hypopharynx is going to swell and start swelling faster than you can get that tube down. So be very, very cautious and be very rapid on your assessments and your skills to these patients. Circumferential burns of the chest can compromise breathing because breathing and because the burn's gonna dry the skin out, it's going to make it uh, hard. So it's gonna restrict the uh, the reflexes of the, the chest when they try to breathe out and breathe in. Circumferential burns of an extremity can lead to a compartment syndrome, resulting in a neurovascular compromise and irreversible damage if not appropriately treated, to where they may have to do like a cut down to where the skin can swell on its own versus um, uh, trying to stay intact where they open the skin, basically allowing it to, to to swell and not bust the skin. If you suspect a compromise, always call for ALS. Um, not saying that you can't handle that simple burn when it's only 10 miles from the hospital, but if you have the ability and you can get a ALS to intervene, that's the better that you can do or request them to come to the scene. Um, five factors to help determine the severity of the burn. I would remember this. What is the depth of the burn? What is the extent of the burn? Are any critical areas involved? Your critical areas involved are, are concerned are face, upper airway, hands, feet, and genitalia. Does the patient have any pre-existing medical conditions other than the current injuries. Is the patient younger than five years old? Is the, I'm sorry, younger than five or older than 55? 
burns to the face are, uh, are of particular importance, owning to the potential of airway involvement. Burns to the hand or feet or over joints are considered very serious because of the potential loss of function as a result of scarring. So those again need to make sure any type of burn, I highly, highly suggest that they go to a trauma center and or a burn center. Your local protocols may say that they report to a trauma center, your local trauma center, and then they are moved to a burn center. It may not be in the same place. Um, for example, like uh, Central Mississippi, um, our university medical center is not the burn center for the state, but it is the, the main trauma center for the state of Mississippi. So that being the case, most of your patients go directly to the trauma center and then they are transferred by air when stabilized over to the burn center. Superficial uh, first degree burns. So a first degree burn is superficial. <clears throat> Involved only the top layer of skin is the epidermis. The skin turns red, but does not blister or burn through this top layer. The burn site is often painful, just like a sunburn. Partial thickness or second degree burn involves the epidermis and some portions of the dermis. These burns do not destroy the entire thickness of the skin, nor is the subcutaneous tissue injured. Typically, the skin is mo moist, molted, and white to red. Blisters are present, can cause intense pains, just like uh, having grease pop on you. We know how painful that is. Sometimes they will swell up, and those are the blisters they're talking about. Uh, so a full thickness or a third degree burn. It extends through all layers of the skin and may involve subcutaneous muscle, bone, or internal organs. The burned area is dry and leathery and may appear white, dark brown, or even charred. If the nerve endings have been destroyed, a severely burned area may have no feeling at all. The surrounding less severe burn may be extremely painful. Significant airway burns are very, very serious. Uh, they may be associated with a singular hair uh, within the nostril, soot around the nose and mouth, uh, hoarseness, or hypoxia. These patients should rapidly be transported to the ED or facility capable of advanced airway management. Back to what I was saying a while ago, the faster that we can get that uh, tube down their throat, the better off it's gonna be because if they happen to do close up, that's all that we get. We're only gonna get that one chance. Here's the pictures of a few. Um, figure A is a superficial first degree burn. B is a partial thickness, you see the blisters there. And then C is a full thickness third degree burn. You can tell how old D is. You can tell that's an old picture because that mask that's on that patient, it's not even what we use anymore these days. So if you look at the top picture where it shows the first degree, you see it's a little redness on the skin. Again, the best thing we can resort that to is uh, sunburn. Second degree is going to be more of your um, bubbles. You're going to have the, the pus pockets. And then most of the time, your full thickness or third degrees are going to have that charring charcoal look. Um, that's, that's how you can kind of give a quick field uh, reference on to which one is which. A rule of palm. Now, uh, I ain't getting in your business, but I would 100% start, start writing this down right here. The rule of palm estimates the surface area that has been burned by comparing its size of the patient's palm, which is roughly equal to 1% of the patient's total bottle, body surface area. <coughs> the 
rule of nines. These two are very important. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna see what I can do for you. Let me see if I can copy my notes. Uh, I can't. Um, I would definitely know what the rule of palm is and what the rule of nines are. Estimate, so the rule of nine estimates the extent of a burn by dividing the body into sections, each representing about 9% of the total body surface area. The portions differ for infants, children, and adults. When you calculate the extent of a burn, include only partial and full thickness burns, document superficial burns, but do not include them in the body surface area estimate of the extent of burn injury. So here is a picture of the rule of nines. So the arms on ch infant, child, and adult are all nines. The chest and back, well, so the chest and back equal 18, so it's nine and nine. All genitalia, sorry, I, I said that wrong, I completely. So the chest and the back are 18 each. All genitalia are one. You can see the difference right there in the child and infant versus the adult, how the legs vary in different percentages. The entire head of an infant is 18, a child is 12, an adult is nine. A lot of times these tests, uh, National Registry will also tell you that they had burns to the upper extremities and to the chest, what is the percentage of burns? So both arms total 18 and the chest is 18. So you turn around and say, there's your number. Um, knowing this, uh, this picture is very, very, very good to study off of. If you have your phone, I would either take a screenshot I know where you can find this. Print it out. It's very important. When assessing a burn, it is important to classify the patient's burns. So you want to be able to classify it by source of burn, depth of burn, and what is the severity of the burn. Um, if you're unable to classify which is the source, that's okay. Um, depth, you need to give it like first, second, third degree. Um, and then how, what is the severity? Is it a life-threatening? Um, is it something that potentially is an airway hazard? Those are some of the things that we need to know about. Let's take a quick break. Um, let's take 10 minutes. Um, I will see you guys at 7.02. Anybody have any questions so far of what we've gone to, what we're at? Uh, is everybody up to par or you want me to keep going or hold off? All right, so scene safety. So ensure that the factors that lead to the patient's burns, injuries do not pose a hazard for your crew. So make sure that when you do this, that you are not going to be injured, all right? So what are the mechanisms of injury? We need to know that. Attempt to determine the type of burn that has been sustained by and, and the MOI. Uh, what the patient reports will often provide important information about the extent of the injury. We do wanna assess the scene for any environmental hazards. Determine the number of patients. Call for additional resources early if necessary, and consider the potential for spinal injuries, broken bones, inhalation injuries, or other injuries due to a burn, okay? So make sure, and I don't know if it's gonna talk about this, but on any type of burn, you want to do your best to remove any type of jewelry, because if that jewelry gets hot enough, it's gonna to continue to burn necklaces, rings, uh, bracelets, things like that need to come off of the patient. If you want to stick them back in their pocket once you get them off, that's fine. Um, I don't suggest leaving them in the ambulance and remembering to turn them back to the hospital because 
everything in the world going to be going on and you're going to forget, I promise you. And then probably five hours later, you're going to be like, oh my God, there's this dude watching my car and this, in the back of the ambulance, what do I do? So remember that. Oh, push the button. What is the, so, <clears throat> sorry. What the patient reports will often provide important information about the extent of the injury, if they're able to tell you anything. Again, like your shows, assess the scene for hazards, determine the number of patients, call for injuries and potential other injuries. Um, begin with a rapid assessment. Um, from the general impression, we want to know what they look like. What are some of the clues that we see that are on this scene? And what is a life-threatening injury? We need to jump on those rapid, uh, those rapidly and treat them fast. Be suspicious of clues that may indicate abuse. Does this look like somebody burned them? Does it look like they were abused in any form or fashion? Uh, consider the need for manual spinal stabilization. If you need to reach up there and grab their neck and make sure that it doesn't move, assign somebody to that. Uh, check for manual, uh, consider, uh, sorry, check for uh, responsiveness using the APU scale. Um, are they able to uh, form to you? Uh, uh, and all patients whose level of consciousness is less than alert, uh, who is less than alert and oriented, apply high flow O2 with a non rebreather mask and provide immediate transport. I say no matter what, apply any type of burn patient with high flow O2. Um, so y'all remember always give oxygen. Um, airway and breathing, be alert to signs that the patient has inhaled hot gases or vapors. Again, smut around the facial hairs. Uh, you can see burns around the facial hair. Um, if they have any type of facial burns, you're automatically going to assume that this is a trauma patient. Heavy amounts of secretions and frequent coughing may indicate a respiratory burn. They're not able to, like, they can't keep their mouth moistened, so it always feels like there's something about the throat. They're constantly coughing. Uh, you may have some upper bleeding in that from the airway. Um, inspect, and, inspect and palpate the chest for DCAP BTLS. Obviously, circulation controls significant bleeding. If the patient has an obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, we're going to fix that first and foremost. Then treat the patient for shock as quickly as possible. Um, treat, the, treat shock and burn patients and preventing heat loss. Uh, cover the patient with a blanket. I told you that while ago, remove the clothing um, and then turn around and uh, cover them if possible. Um, consider rapid transport. That is something that we know that is, we need to rapidly get these patients to a facility that can take care of them. We need to get them to a surgical procedure as fast as we can. Um, if we can get ALS to meet us in route, that would be amazing. But again, we may not be able to do that. We may just have to transport them ourselves. Invest, investigate the chief complaint. Be alert. Hmm. Be alert for signs and symptoms of other injuries due to the mechanism of injury. If the patient was burned in a confined space, suspect an inhalation injury. When burns result from explosive forces, be alert for other internal injuries and possible fractures. Obtain a medical history and be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms and pertinent negatives. Sample history includes, uh, along with the sample history, ask some of the following questions. Are you having any difficulty breathing? Are you having any difficulty swallowing? Are you having any pain? And check whether the patient has an emergency medical identification device. We're talking about like a uh, internal paste to make, uh, pacemaker. Uh, those are important just as well as anything else. Sample history needs to ask the following questions with the burn. Uh, again, it's the same exact things that we just asked. 
check whether the patient had, uh, why is that double? I'm sorry, y'all, that's like on my screen. I'm trying to figure out why it's, fix that. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, secondary assessments. When we start to do, this is gonna be more of our physical assessment. This is gonna be hands-on. We're gonna make sure to put our hands and check every little bit of the person. I'm um, assess the patient from head to toe looking for the cavity TLS. Uh, make a rough estimate using the rule of nines of the extent of the burn injury or the burned area. Determine the classification of the burns that has the, uh, the victim has sustained. Determine the severity of the burn. What is the depth? And package the patient for transport based on your findings. Remember, if you go to cover them and they're burned and is any type of cotton and or plastic, it's going to stick. See, we know vital signs are important. We need to make sure that we check, uh, we have our oxygen saturation, if there's any type of carbon monoxide, um, way to check that with a ALS arrival, they can do that. But if we are unable to get a blood pressure due to their, we have uh, their upper trunk is severely swollen, that's okay. Um, Depending upon your agency, they may allow you to do um, a blood pressure from the lower extremity. That's something that you're going to have to ask your agency. Reassessment. Again, we're going to continue to reassess these every five minutes. We know that is very important. Um, when it talks about reevaluate your interventions, we are looking to make sure that the burn is not continuing. We talked about the jewelry, any type of metal that's on this person. Assess any trouble breathing. If we notice it, treat it, fix it, provide them with supplemental oxygen. Any type of circulation, if they're, if they're bleeding uncontrollably, you should have controlled it by now. And uh, if it's something that has just come up, uh, fix it, assess it, and try your best to keep that controlled. When we talk about reassessing the patient, reevaluate entries, uh, provide oxygen is mandatory for inhalation burns. Um, if the patient has signs of hyperperfusion, treat aggressively for shock because it's going to happen. Your burn patients are going to go into shock if you do not do something rapidly. Communication, communicate everything that you can with the hospital and far enough advance because we need to have a surgical team slash and or burn team uh, on standby and or at the ER already awaiting our arrival. We hope that they come and assist us, get the patient uh, out of the ambulance because we're gonna have our hands full. We've had our hands full with this patient. Um, we're gonna provide them with enough information, basically what we tell them they can run with and be able to treat this patient. Obviously they're going to be able to find uh, further things out um, because there's a lot more of them. They have more hands, uh, they have some more assistance, and they have more tools to be able to assess this patient in a better way. Not saying what we did is not better, but it's better from the get-go. We're just continuing to give them better treatment. Your first responsibility is caring for the patient with a burn. Um, when caring for a burn patient, you can look in your book to talk about following steps on drill 27-2. Uh, we want to make sure that no other injury is occurred. Um, to keep them safe throughout the transport, so make sure no other injuries are hurt. Thermal burns. Thermal burns can be caused by heat. Um, most commonly, uh, they are caused by scalds or open flames. A flame burn is very often in a deep burn, especially if a person's clothing catches on fire. A scalding burn is most commonly seen in children and handicapped adults that can, uh, but can happen to anyone particularly while cooking. Uh, coming in contact with hot objects uh, produces a contact burn. Contact burns are rarely deep unless the patient was prevented from drawing away from the hot object. You will see on children, you'll see their buttocks, their genitalia are burned because they're set down in hot water. Same thing for the paralyzed, the uh, 
dependent person, the one that depends on somebody else to take care of them. They may have also been lowered down uh, into scalding water. Uh, they may have an injury uh, or they may, you may get it on the back end side to where the caregiver has been treating it for a while, trying to hide it, but it has gotten to a point where the patient is now septic and they're a lot worse. And that's something that you find while doing your assessment is that they've been burned. It's something that you need to report to the facility so they can uh, help treat that patient better. Steam burn can produce a topical burn, which is basically a scald. Uh, minor steam burns are common when the microwaving food covered with plastic wraps. I know we've all done that. We've all touched it like, Jesus, why did I do that? Now we knew that was gonna be hot. A flash burn is produced by an explosion, which may briefly expose a person to a very intense heat. Um, lightning strike can also cause a flash burn, flash burn, if I can say that correctly. And thermal burn. So stopping the burning source, cool the burned area if appropriate, and remove all jewelry. I think I've told you that at least three times now. Maintain a high index of suspicion for inhalation injuries. Increased exposure time will increase damage to the patient. Obviously, that is, we shouldn't have to say that, but we do have to say that. Uh, the larger uh, the burn, the more likely the patient will be susceptible to hypothermia and or hypovolemia. All patients with large surface burns uh, should have a dry sterile dressing applied. Inhalation injuries can occur when burning takes place in the enclosed space without ventilation. Um, upper airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of superheated gases. It's the same thing uh, like a patient being involved in a house fire and they've been stuck in there a little bit longer than normal. You always automatically assume that they've had the inhalation of the superheated gases. Lower airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of chemicals and particular particulate matter. Um, Any type you go to a industrial setting and they say that they've had uh, a certain type of inhalation. Well, when you go there, you should make sure that you can say what kind of chemical that was. I think we're actually gonna go over chemical burns. I'm sorry, I'll wait a second. Um, when treating a patient for inhalation injuries, you may encounter severe upper respiratory swelling, which requires immediate intervention. We need to get ALS there as fast as we can because this person is going to need to be intubated rapidly. Um, some of the symptoms we're going to look for are a strider, hoarse voice, singed nasal hairs, burns to the face, carbon particulates in the sputum. So if they go to spit and it's black, that's obvious. We're gonna apply a cool mist aerosol therapy or humidified oxygen to help reduce some of the minor edema. Edema, sorry. The combustion process produces a variety of toxic gases and the less, whoa, sorry y'all, I hit the wrong button. Uh, the less efficient um, is combusted process the more toxic the gas that they may be created. So toxic gas obviously is a more of a industrial setting. Same thing can be in your industrial setting. If you have somebody that loves to clean and they mix chemicals together, that is set up for failure. I would highly, highly recommend to never mix two chemicals. Uh, you need to be very cautious about that. So you need to be you know, careful. Carbon monoxide or CO intoxication should be considered whenever a group of people in the same place all report a headache. Patients with severe poisoning usually will, will have a normal oxygen saturation. Um, hydrogen cyanide is generated by combustion. Signs and symptoms include the central nervous, respiratory, and cardiovascular system. Um, faintness, anxiety, abnormal vital signs, headaches, seizures, paralysis, and comas. Uh, now we know that there, uh, 
and all that is going to be worse. Uh, the further that it gets, the longer that they're exposed. And if we're going to this, and that's what we think, we have to think of our personal security and safety higher than anything else. So if that's what we believe, that it's something that's uh, you know, dangerous, we, we don't need to go in there and we need to wait on the proper people with the proper PPE to get into there and remove these patients. Pre-hospital treatment of a patient with suspected hydrogen cyanide poison includes decon, supportive care, Obviously, ALS, we have some medication, some areas uh, that will allow us to treat that. Um, care for any toxic gas exposures. You need to be able to recognize that. Hopefully, that we can recognize it or it's already been recognized. Identify and supportive treatment. A lot of this, too, is once we get these patients taken care of, we have to just keep them comfortable until either ALS arrives and or the air support gets there. Because as basics, there's not a lot that we can do for them. Now you may be able to drop a King Airway in depending upon your agency and your state, but that's only if they go unresponsive. You're not gonna be trying to shove this big tube down somebody's throat when they're not ready and they're still trying to breathe on their own. To be cautious of that. So here's our chemical burns. So chemical burns can occur when a, whenever a toxic substance comes in contact with the body. Most chemical burns are caused by a strong acid or strong alkalis. The eyes are particularly vulnerable, um, like battery. Battery acid is one of them. That is, I know that's a powder, but that's still considered a chemical burn. The severity of the burn is directly related to these three factors. The type of chemical, concentration of the chemical, and how long were you exposed? To prevent exposure to hazardous materials, determine if you can safely approach the patient. In some cases, you must have to wait until a hazmat team arrives uh, and decons the patient. Whether appropriate chemical resistant gloves and eye protection whenever you are caring for a patient with a chemical burn. The best way that we can move, remove chemicals is by using a powder. We can try to neutralize it if we know what type it is, or we can dust it off of the patient. The severity of the burn will depend on the type of chemical, its strength, duration of exposure, and the area of the body exposed. To stop the burning process, remove any chemical from the patient. Always try to brush dry chemicals off the skin and clothing before using water. Remove the patient's clothing, including shoes, socks, gloves, and jewelry, and even eyeglasses. Take great care to ensure that you do not come in contact with the chemical because we don't need you as a patient. The patient should be properly decontaminated by properly trained personnel. For liquid, immediately begin to flush the burned area with large amounts of water. Continue flooding the area with gallons of water for 15 to 20 minutes after the patient says the burning pain has stopped. If the patient's eye has been burned, hold the eyelid open without applying any type of pressure, so we don't want to put any kind of pressure on the eye. You're still going to flood the eye with lots of water, just trying to flush it out and keep it flushed out. As with any substance, once the fluid has become contaminated with the chemical, collect it and properly dispose of it. But majority of the time, if that's where we're at, that's going to be somebody else's job as a hazmat responder. Conduct all proper decontamination prior to loading the patient. We do not want to take this hazmat scene with us down the road and potentially uh, contaminate a medical facility. Electrical burns may be the result of contact with high or low voltage electricity. High voltage burns may occur when the utility workers make direct contact with the power lines. Uh, ordinary household current can cause severe burns and cardiac arrhythmias. 
For electrical flow, there must be a complete circuit between the electrical source and the ground. So you have completed that source. That is why the particular person is getting electrocuted. Um, insulators uh, is any substance that prevents this uh, circuit from being uh, closed. And a conductor is any substance that allows a current to flow through it. And that may be you. You may be the insulator. Sorry, you may be the conductor and allowing the electricity to flow through your body. Obviously, the human body is a very good conductor. Electrical burns occur when the body or part of it completes a circuit connecting a power source to the ground. So you just made that circuit live. So the type of electrical current, magnitude of the current, and voltage have serious effects of types of burns. So your safety is particularly important when you are called to the scene of the, uh, involving electricity, because we don't need two patients. You gotta be careful. A burn appears, uh, appears when the electricity enters the body and exits. There are two types of dangers. Uh, there may be a large amount of deep tissue injury, and the patient may go into cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest from the electrical shock. That is very true. Um, if it's a high voltage, they're probably, they're, they're, they're done. They're gonna be, I mean, it's over with. Um, here is a nasty picture. Uh, I'm not real sure where that injury is, but that is a burn. Um, it, it can be very deep. Um, as you can see, this is some third degree burns right around in here, um, up in this area. Uh, I'm not real sure where that's at on a particular body, but that, that's a pretty, you start to see like first and second down in here. And this is kind of more of your deep third areas up in here. There are some deep thirds in here, but most of this is first and seconds right in here. So that's, that's a very painful, your third degree is not going to be painful because it's already burnt through everything super fast, but this is going to be a painful process. Uh, so when we go to take care of these, um, the best thing that we can do is stop the electrical current, do our best to shut the power off and or remove the patient from the source. Um, electrical current can cross the chest and cause cardiac arrest or any type of arrhythmia. If we have to start CPR, start CPR. We can shock them too with more electricity. Um, always, always, always be prepared to defibrillate even if you're just working a regular cardiac arrest, but specifically an electrical injury. Uh, supplement O2 should be done. Treat any kind of soft tissue injuries on your secondary uh, assessment and then provide rapid transport. So let's talk about taser injuries. So majority of the taser injuries are going to be from the barbs. Uh, barbs are generally treated as impelled objects and removed. I've removed them as a paramedic multiple times. Um, the book tries to say that we need to go see a physician. I mean, it, I, I don't know. Um, some areas in some jurisdictions, the EMTs are also allowed to remove them. Um, you still have to treat the patient. You need to get full vitals, do a full assessment. And if the patient signs refusal and or transport, you need to make sure that's done. Um, a cited, excited delirium is a common cause associated with illegal drug ingestion, which potentially can cause an injury after being electrocuted. Um, in a taser device and a patient with true excited delirium has previously associated with dys dysrhythmias and potentially cardiac arrest. Make sure you have access to an AED when you respond to a patient who has been exposed to a taser. A lot of times you've seen in reports where uh, police officers have tased or individuals have tased another individual and they have died from either the fall, striking their head, uh, or going into cardiac arrest from it. Um, the particular county that I work in, we've had uh, one instance is when we first got our tasers as we were all out on the roads, everybody was kind of side up about it. And one of our lieutenants actually tased somebody and the dude uh, went into cardiac arrest as soon as I put my uh, truck in park. Uh, we're going to help him you know, and then we show up instead of trying to restrain the guy. Now we're trying to perform CPR and trying to do some medic skills on him, which is not what we all expected. 
radiation burns. So these potential threats include incidents related to uh, the use and transport of radioactive isotopes. Um, first, determine if there has been a radiation exposure anytime that you respond to these and attempt to determine whether ongoing exposure is continuous or not. There are three types. I would know this with my not alpha, beta, and gamma. So alpha has little penetration injury and is easily stopped by the skin. Beta particles have greatest penetration power and can travel much further in the air than the alpha particles. They can penetrate the skin, but can be blocked by some potential protective clothing that is designed for this purpose. Gamma is the threat for gamma radiation is directly uh, proportional to its wavelength. Um, very, uh, very penetrating uh, and is easily passes through the body and solid materials. So alpha and beta, you can literally stand and alpha is, there's alpha radiation in the normal background of, the, of our daily environment. Beta, you can actually put uh, an object between you, same thing, uh, gamma has to be a pretty thick object, but you can stop these um, just by things that we have out there. Like a gamma, uh, can uh, a fire truck with a thousand gallons of water, for example, can stop uh, gamma radiations from uh, passing through. I don't wanna be around if it does that though, because that's a lot of radiation. Most ionizing radiation accidents involve gamma, which is x-rays. People who have sustained a radiation exposure generally do not pose a risk to others, but incidents involving explosions, patients may be contaminated. Once there is no threat you, to you, begin treatment to the uh, ABCs and treat the patient for any burns or trauma and wash the open wounds. Notify the emergency department, uh, limit your duration of exposure Increase your distance from the source and attempt to place shielding between yourself and the source of the gamma radiation. Obviously, if this is something that's going to happen, there's gonna be multiple agencies there. This is gonna be probably a very large scale uh, response once it's been notified. But even though when you transport your patient, you need to let the medical facility know that you're bringing in a potential radiation exposure. Um, they may tell you, stand by in the ambulance bay. When you arrive, we will come get you. Or they may tell you to go to a particular area because a lot of these hospitals don't want to contaminate their ER with potential x-ray exposures because that's going to put them out of service for a while. All right, so when we talk about sterile dressings, most wounds need to be covered by a conventional four by four. We can go up to a four by eight, uh, ABD pads, trauma pads. Um, the universal dressing is ideal to cover large open wounds. So that is more of your ABD pad. Um, I forgot the size of those. We also have pads. Uh, majority of the trucks should have like a trauma dressing pad. And that's a big bulky, uh, the big bulky, um, I just went blank pad that we want to cover the area. Gauze, any type of gauze we can use to protect uh, minor wounds, we can use them to uh, any, so if they, if you're going to go put a, a sterile dressing, make sure that it's made of uh, Vaseline and it has the aluminum foil and it's going to be an aluminum foil package because it's not going to stick. That's one thing that we... <coughs> want to make sure is that this does not stick to any injury um, because it's, remember, it has to come off somehow. If you stick it to a burn, you're not going to be liked at all when it's time to remove this. Um, bandages to keep your dressing in place during transport. Obviously, soft roller bandages. We have our roll of gauzes, triangular bandages. There's proper ways to protect a wound, uh, protect an area. But at the same time is, if you can cover it and it's covered and secured, it don't matter how pretty it is. It may not be the prettiest thing in the world, 
but it's on there, the patient's protected, that's our main goal. So I'm kind of to the point is, I don't care how you do it, just cover it. <laughs> Make sure that it is something that it's, it's good for the patient and we're not gonna cause any other harm. Adhesive tape obviously holds things in, <coughs> sorry y'all, excuse me. Um, tape is very good, it helps hold things in place. It does also allow uh, the injury site to swell. You see on your screen, it shows do not use elastic bandages to secure the dressing. Um, if the area swells too much, it may become a tourniquet. And any time that you bandage an area, doesn't matter if it's a soft splint, <coughs> a curl X roll, whatever, you always need to check the distal pulse on that limb to make sure that you haven't created any type of impairment of circulation or their uh, loss of sensation. And that goes the same way with splinting. You should always splint it, check for a pulse prior to splinting and after you split an injury. Air splints and vacuum splints are very useful in stabilizing the broken extremities and can be used to help uh, control the bleeding from soft tissue injuries. If a wound continues to bleed despite the use of direct pressure, quickly proceed to the use of a tourniquet. As is the end of the chapter. Um, one thing I need to add is if anybody has any questions, concerns, please let me know. You can talk to me. Uh, you can type it in the text group. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you guys. But um, that's it for the night. Uh, does anybody out there have any questions, concerns, or problems? Um, just to let y'all know, after tonight, there is only eight more class, class meetings. Um, if you are not caught up on your test, um, you're just going to have, we need to make sure that that's done. Um, some of you have not logged into JB Learning in a hot minute. You have had access, you should have access, and we need to make sure that you're taking your test. Uh, Sydney, if you can hang on, I'll talk to you after this. Uh, right on, Tamara, I'll be here. Um, but that's kind of it. Um, anybody else have any questions or concerns? All right, well, there is your class code for tonight. Also in the chat group. All right, well, listen, if y'all don't have any questions, concerns, y'all have a good night. Didn't it give me two seconds? I'm just trying to pull it up. Okay. Now, overall. Yes, sir, the overall. Get that, I wasn't gonna say it out loud. Okay, give me one second. Okay, and that's um, with the uh, attendance and everything included.